Hello, Internet. It's Gino, that from Gino Greco here again for another episode of Deep Listens. Today, we're going to be talking about Mother 3. Well, Mother 3. No. No. I can't even. No. So, Try again. Fun fa- at the end of the podcast, the last <laughs> podcast, we said we were going to do Mother 3. And um, we're liars. I don't know if you know this, listeners. Mother 3 didn't come out in English. Like a fool, I didn't realize it's kind of been an ongoing joke at Nintendo to berate the people who want Mother 3 to come out in English. So we all learn Japanese. So we all learn Japanese, and here we are. We're going to talk about... Nope. Uh, I learned that, one, it never came out in English. Two, the only way to really get access to it in a playable form is via piracy, and I'm not a thief. Very noble. In the time period that would have required to play the entire game. Also, it's a long RPG. So mm-hmm. we found that with all of these things, it seemed very unreasonable to finish it in the time frame we had allotted. And so we changed to a game that's completely reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, we decided to play Near Automata. So today's episode will be on Near Automata. Or Automata. I was going to say Automata. I think yeah, it's but... Automata. Automata. If, if that's what we agree, you say it's... automata. I say automata. <laughs> Auto tomato. Does Auto near tomato. mean anything? It I is... never looked it up. This game is a sequel to the game near. We'll talk about it. It's okay. a thing. Do the yeah. do the intros first, and then we'll yes. get to the... right. We have, we have a procedure. Yes. So that first voice you heard, that deep voice you heard, is our master of machines, Pete Busby. What's going on, everybody? Here's a game that hits a lot of things I like to talk about, so I'm excited to do so. Fun fact for this week's podcast, it's about a man named Kim Peek. Kim Peek is just a generally very interesting man, so you should look him up in general. But I'll just tell you one very cool thing about him. So Kim Peek was born without a corpus callosum. So that's the sort of bundle of nerves that connects the left and right hemispheres of your brain. So who knows if it was because of this, but Kim Pete could actually read two pages of the phone book at once. His left eye would read one and his right eye would read the other. He could then recite the information back to you. So he was retaining both pages at once. Pretty incredible. So what you're saying is we're being held back by our lobes being connected. Well, he had a lot of other cognitive impairments. So, you know, trade off. This one there is trick. something that I know. Uh, that is related you can actually have an operation if you have certain neural problems to separate the two halves of the brain mm-hmm. i don't know why you would do that but uh seizures ah yes because you want to be able to read because you want to be able to read two pages of the phone book at the same <laughs> time it. you're rolling the mm-hmm. dice exactly great power comes from <laughs> sacrifice <laughs> Yes, this is truly the dark night of classes. <laughs> of classes. You have to pay a little bit of life, and then you get great power. Mm-hmm. Um, that second voice you just heard was our, uh, I don't have anything, Android Admiral. Good try. M. Paladino. Hello. I'm very excited to hear mostly what Pete has to say about this game. I'm sure you you both will have insight, but I know he's going to have some fine uh, stuff to say about it. It's a good game. And given that this is our 100th proper episode of Deep Listens, Ooh. we've gone to the crypts and we have reclaimed a previous host. <gasps> We've downloaded his mind into a new body. <laughs> and Absolutely we are, not. We are good to record another podcast. Welcome I back. Did, I did not consent. I... Welcome back, yes. Billy. Machines are people. Rothert. That's. I, <laughs> thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna leave. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. Thanks for visiting. I'm glad we revived him for that. <laughs> We've made uh, some upgrades in Billy 2.0. <laughs> we turned Absolutely. him on and he said, please turn me off. <laughs> Absolutely not. I do not want any of this. I wish right, thanks everybody God. for tuning in. Um, I'm really, I'm, I'm really thankful that I was invited to come back for episode 100 of Deep Listens. <clears throat> I, um, also very much enjoyed Nier and have some cool things to say about it. Well, maybe not cool. I think they're cool. 
and I'm sure you all will talk shit about me for them, but, you know, that's, I'm going to say them anyway. You know, fuck it. That is fair. And before we get started with our 100th episode on Near Automata. There you go. We've got emails. Woo! We, we asked for emails and we got some for our 100th episode. Reminder, you can get in touch with the show at DeepListensPod on Twitter, DeepListens.Libsyn.com. We've got our comment sections and DeepListensPodcast at gmail.com. Um, here's our first... So should I do emails first or should I do our announcement first? I should probably uh, I announcement. Mm -hmm. Do the announcement. Do the announcement first. Okay, so... Since it's our 100th episode, we'll be getting to our emails in a second. Uh, we we have an announcement to make because we've been doing this for over three years now. Um, very long time. Very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought, hey, y'all who are listening, y'all who are enjoying this, um, why not start a Patreon to offset some of the hosting costs that we are we've incurred over the years, some of the costs of buying a new game every week or two weeks. Or more for some of us who record more regularly, and um, to see if we can make the show a little bit more professional, a little bit more regular. Um, so, uh, anything you could chip in would be much appreciated. Uh, we have started a Discord for members for Patreon subscribers. Um, our Discord is Patreon.com/deeplistens. So good name. Good name. Yeah, fitting name. Uh, so check it out. Um, if you can support us, that would be super awesome. Um, as we see how this goes, uh, right now we've just got a Discord. We're putting together the community. Um, once you, you know, subscribe, we'll add you to the community that way. Um, and we're looking to do things in the future, like, you know, stream the games that we're playing, uh, maybe do something uh, else exclusive for the patrons. So thank you for all your support for just listening. And if you'd like to support us even further, you can do so patreon.com slash deep listens. So thanks. Thanks everyone for, you know, obviously helping us keep going this long mm -hmm. regardless. Now it's time to get to the emails. I'm going to have to get better at that. It's okay. It's the first one. It's the first time. Yeah. And, You've you only know. done this a hundred times more <laughs> before. <laughs> You know That's why I mean? we need to get more professional. It's all right. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, so our first email comes in from a listener. This comes in from Peter, and I don't think it was you, Pete? No. No, I don't think so. We have another Peter listener, apparently. Outstanding. Very it exciting. Says, Hello, Deep Ones. Ooh, I like That's that. That's a good – ooh. We should – can we hold on to that or something? We could. We definitely could. that could. be our fans' names? Sure. Maybe that's what our fans are. We yeah. Still be like the deep crew. Mm -hmm. I finally managed to listen to all your gaming podcasts except the most recent one, and thus wanted to tell you that I very much enjoy your work. Thank you. Hey, hey great Thanks. email so far. Uh, you managed to be informative, amusing, and hand out all the animal facts your listeners could ever <laughs> need. Pete, you didn't hand one out yet, so I'm going to give you some time to think. Well, uh, I give Kim Pete facts instead. I wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, one of the humans are animals. That's true. Outstanding point. <laughs> And machines are humans. Uh, so one of you might want to stop insulting our future AI overlords about the potential lack of <laughs> souls, though. Oh. That's um, appropriate. Uh, that's the email. I'm not – I didn't make that up. That's the whole email? No, that's no, no. The that's not the oh. whole email. Uh, but before a certain zombie pie suggests another game about dating pigeons or horses or any other <laughs> animal that didn't get away fast enough, maybe I could make two suggestions for future podcasts as well. One would be old school survival horror game like Resident Evil 2 on the PlayStation 1. You could surely look at the narrative where protagonists arrive too late to pretend – prevent the catastrophe, and can at best hope to escape with their own life, maybe pick up another survivor or two. It's what quite a few people consider the perfect sequel to its pre predecessor. Uh, my other suggestion would be House of the Dead 2, which does feature a kind of antagonist that can be often seen in fiction, the evil environmentalist that wants to destroy humanity to save the world from them. Uh, also in this game, he wants to save the world with zombies. Not my choice for saving the world. And the voice acting is so horrible that your expertise is deeply needed to make sense of it. Not to mention, it's pretty funny. I wish you the best in your future, Peter. Thank you. We will take those into consideration. I'm always looking for more survival horror games to play because I skew more towards the Silent Hills. And so I'm not necessarily as versed in the genre 
and Toto. Yeah. Zombies are, are rife with metaphors, too, from the sort of oh, consumerism yeah. of Dawn of the Dead, too. I mean, you can make an environmentalist message for it as well. I mean, they always – each decade has its own zombie metaphor, really. Mm. Yeah, and every game that we've played – every horror game we've played so far has been interesting, if nothing else. <laughs> I, I'm looking at you, Silent Hill, for the room. <laughs> That's good stuff. <laughs> we have another email. This comes in from Superfan Grandin. Hello. Brandon. He it's said, like Brandon with a G. <laughs> Horrifying. <laughs> uh, congrats on reaching 100 episodes, guys. What a milestone. It's been a while since my last email, so I have some updates and questions. I took your advice and played Gre- uh, Gree, and it's incredible. Anyone listening with a Switch should pick it up. So that's Absolutely. G-R-I-S. Just a reminder, really good game, should play it. Uh, the visuals are obviously stunning, but the soundtrack put a ton of work in as well. I download, downloaded it on Spotify, and it's one of my favorites to listen to while I'm at work. I know that you guys talked about finding the acceptance achievement and how it fits so well with that particular stage of grief, but the achievements for each of the other stages are equally impressive. I'll list them off in case you didn't see them. Uh, spoilers. So here's some spoilers for Gree. Uh, heads up. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute, so can you please... Uh... PM me in Skype when you're done talking about Grease spoilers. Sure. Sure. All right. So, denial. At the very beginning of the game, after you gain the ability to jump, backtrack to the left until you get to a statue of a woman, where at this point your character will drop to their knees. If you don't touch the controller for a few minutes, you will eventually stand back up and you'll get the achievement. Anger. In the black and white section, after you fall down the shaft where you break things to release birds, there are three statues of a woman. Smashing all of these will give you the anger achievement. Bargaining. In one location, look it up online. There's a large statue of a woman. If you stand in front of it and try to sing by pressing A, you'll get this achievement. Depression. In the underwater level where the sea turtle will be, swim down past the shell into the passage at the bottom. Everything will become too dark to see, but if you swim down and to the left, you'll eventually swim into a hidden passage. At the end of this passage is a room with a statue of the woman positioned as though she's sinking in water. Finding this room triggers the achievement. Acceptance, you guys already talked about this one. I feel like the achievements help to flesh out the story and made for some especially cool moments. So if you haven't seen them, I recommend at least YouTubing them. Very cool. All right, someone let Billy, he can listen again. All right, I'll tell him. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that there were, like, secret achievements to I didn't that either. game. I All right. go back. I don't think I've heard you guys. Uh, all right, time for a few all right, questions. thanks for letting me know. Time for a few questions. I don't think I've heard you guys officially list this yet, so what are your top three in any order favorite games? Oof. Oh, no. Drop a bombshell on us there. <clears throat> I, um, I, right. can, I, can, I can go pretty I can easily go here, actually. Go, Billy. Um, well, do you know you're you know you're the big shot around here. Why don't you go hang on first? Big shot. Sure, mm-hmm. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Um, so my number one is obviously Final Fantasy IX with a bullet. Yeah. Uh, not close. Uh, number two is probably Psychonauts. Um, number three vacillates between Final Fantasy VIII, um, Final Fantasy X, and probably Persona 4. Those games are, are all up there for me. But one and two are in cement. Okay, Billy. Yeah, I also have a one and two in cement. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> Um, I also have a one and two kind of in cement here, and my one is going to be Ocarina of Time. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the most influential game of my childhood. Uh, for me, my number two is also pretty uh, pretty much locked in, and that's going to be uh, Shadow of the Colossus, which is the game that we did our very first podcast on. Um, I could replay that game ad nauseum as with... Um, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And I'm sure that if I were to be, you know, truthful, I think maybe Legend of Zelda games would, would claim a lot of my top spots, but I'm just going to limit it to one for now. And then my rank three, like most favorite game of all time, um, I might actually be... I, I, I didn't think of this until maybe like the last 30 seconds, but the game that I really enjoyed the most might have been The Last of Us, actually. Sounds about right. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of surprised that I didn't go for like another Nintendo title or something along those lines, because those were also very influential, but that's a game that I was just... I was drowning in for months and would not... like, would not be pulled away from it for anything. Cool. Uh, Peter M., who's ready? 
I can probably go. So my top one would probably be Fire Emblem Sacred Stones. Mm -hmm. Fire Emblem's always been just flat out my favorite series, and I think this is the one that I like the best. Number two would probably be a, a fairly obscure older game for the, I want to say the Game Boy Color, actually. But it was called uh, Revelations the Demon Slayer. Hmm. You guys know this one? Why have you not picked Revelations the Demon Slayer for a <laughs> podcast yet? I don't think we can even find it anymore. But it had a very cool sort of like negotiation mechanic where you could recruit monsters through conversations. You could also get Lucifer to join your party. Is that eventually. a Shin Megami That'd Tensei nice. game? That sounds like a Shin Megami Tensei game. It might be. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Third one, the third slot would probably vastly. I mean, there are a lot of worthy games you could put in there. You could put in Ocarina of Time. I might put in Shadow of the Colossus, too. But I think what really has to go there is <clears throat> probably Game of the Year, Val's Story of Bissell City. Oh, of course. <laughs> the, game, the game you replay over and over again. You nah, just probably, can't get enough. I'd probably pick Shadow of the Colossus, too. I mean, I know it's a little obvious, but it deserves it. Hmm. That's fair. And M? Um, hmm. Well, the game that I probably spent the most time on uh, in my entire life uh, is probably Final Fantasy XIV, just because it's an MMO and I can spend a lot of time in it. Uh, I just got an update, so I am all in um, on that. Uh, Golden Sun was formative uh, when I was a child. Loves uh, the Golden Sun. Hell yeah. We did a podcast probably a month ago or so on it uh the second one yeah um as far as a third one i it's think we can get to two easy three's the hard one yeah three's always tough um i think fire emblem awakenings uh, i really enjoyed um it's been a while since i played it but i have like two copies just because <laughs> it's another I, good yeah i wanted to pick it back up and then i found my old copy of it so, uh, I very rarely go back to games, but those were a few that I just keep going back to. Cool. I want to toss an honorable mention out. I just thought mm -hmm. of this. It might not usurp The Last of Us as far as games that I liked the most or, like, were favorited, mm -hmm. but the Ratchet and Clank series. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll probably pick Ratchet and Clank 3, the Up Your Arsenal uh, game as the as God, the one to nice. note from that, but if if there were like a, a really worthy honorable mention, the Ratchet and Clank series also was massively formative for my childhood, and the mo and the series that took my that really brought me the to the PlayStation universe. Makes sense. All right, next question: Who's the most overrated and most underrated rookie coming into the NBA this year? I'm not sure about overrated, but I think Bull Bull was criminal criminally underrated in the draft he's going to need to bulk up a bit but kevin durant couldn't bench press 185 in the nba combine and he turned out all right his dad could also shoot and he had one of the worst looking shots i've ever seen just look it up when he hit uh six threes and a half i'm excited for the nuggets this year they're going to be fun uh fun team to watch also the big three sounds amazing i'm going to have to pick a team to follow right now i'm thinking power nancy lieberman is their coach and her son was a great player for ur right before we graduated uh tj klein so I'll be tangentially repping the home squad. Uh, have a great podcast, guys. Congrats again. So, Pete, do you have an overrated, underrated on the draft? Any prospect? So I'd agree with Grandin. I think Bol Bol fell way too far. I don't – I think the the idea that Manu Bull could shoot is kind of revisionist history. He did take a lot of threes, but his career percentage, I think, was in the 20s. So, I mean, I wouldn't really say he was a, a shooter Stretch per se. five. Yeah, I'm not that kind of. But it, I do think it's continuously hilarious that Kevin Durant didn't get a single rep at 185 at the combine. That is very In terms funny. of overrated, I'm not sure who I would necessarily pick. Who's the the third Duke guy? Oh. There's uh, Zion, R.J. Barrett, and then who's the other one? Oh, uh, he got drafted by the Hawks. Yeah, I might pick him. I forget his name. Or maybe I'll just pick R.J. Barrett because the Knicks picked him, right? Yeah, they'll probably fuck yeah. that up. Yeah, so they'll probably ruin him somehow. I think underrated, Bull Bull's a good one. Um, he shouldn't have fallen that far, even with foot injuries. Like, he's 
he's a skilled seven foot three. That that doesn't come up all the time. Remember when Hashim Thabit got picked second overall just for being seven three and he could barely 100%. dribble or move? Even though Dewan Blair, a man with no ACLs, wrecked him the entire year. Yeah, so it, it feels like an understatement for uh, Bull Bull to fall down that far. Like it seems ridiculous. Uh, whoever the Suns took, I forget what his name was, but they traded up to pick a guy who's like twenty five, and that's bad when you're drafting someone who's that old. I don't remember either. The Wizards also took a guy they had never spoken to, which is an interesting decision, but I don't know anything about his skill level. Yeah, he, he's uh, the first Japanese – Rui Hachimura, I believe is his name. Um, he, he's pretty good. I just – again, the Wizards will find a way to fuck it up. So I'm going to go ahead and say fuck the Suns. Uh, who they picked was probably the bad choice. You, you really can't go wrong just saying whoever the Suns picked won't turn out well. Um, so – We've got another email, a third email. Uh, this one, this one is now, it's actually was written to me on a bespoke piece of paper that seemed to be like lovingly matted together from wood pulp by hand. Um, and it says, Dear Deep Listens podcast crew, instead of starting my email with an insult or incessant yelling, I thought it would be apt of me to congratulate you all in reaching 100 episodes. Good job. And here's to another 100 podcasts. Likewise, let's not forget to work together to land on that podcast pay dirt. Daddy needs his fucking milk money. Uh, wild tangent aside, I have a real banger of a question. Yeah, question for all of you this week. For today, I am tapping into the creative juices running through those fleshy substances you all call a brain. Better yet, I'm throwing things back to one of the most beloved games in Deep Listens history, Kingdom Hearts. Fuck. Oh, good. Here's the game. You can either retheme a level, replace a fan favorite character, or add a new level or character so long as it messes up the game in some way with a vastly inferior product or IP. The topic applies to every possible Kingdom Hearts game, and while I encourage you to select only Disney IPs, I'll leave things up to you if you need. Uh, after identifying the part you plan to replace, you then have to introduce the replacements. Are you confused? Here are some examples. Here's my Disney example. Sora and company enter a new world they've never seen before with the usual suspects in tow. After scanning the landscape, they see nothing but destroyed, uh, destroyed skyscrapers and overturned vehicles. It's as if the world has been through a war or some sort of catastrophic event. Then Donald steps forward ahead of the party and scans the horizon and declares, I know this place, in a hushed tone and continues to say, this is Puck World. Immediately afterwards, soldier from Lord Dragonus appear and begin shooting at our party. That's right. The world of Mighty Ducks, the animated series, is getting a level in Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> the, the villains are just the Icelandic hockey team. <laughs> With the help of Wildwing Flashblade and the human resistance, Sora must work to find the legendary goalie mask of Duquesne, the Mighty Duck, to send the Saurians back to the mysterious dimensional limbo. Uh, note, I had another example where you're entering the world of the Nightmare Before Christmas, but as you reach Jack Skellington, you realize he's been petrified. Then in comes the evil wizard Calabar, the villain from the made-for-TV Halloween Town starring Debbie Reynolds and Benny the Skeleton Taxi Driver. Uh, here's my non-Disney limbo. Hang on a second. That was yep. actually a good movie. That is a great movie. I haven't seen that one. So cool. And Benny the Skeleton is a cultural icon. So you better shut your fucking mouth, zombie pie. <laughs> uh, here's my non-Disney limbo. All right, so hear me out on this one. I don't have a fancy fan fiction story for this one. Uh, what's something everyone hates about Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2? If you said everything, I need you to stop being a jackass and shout the gummy ship instead. Uh, did you get that? So I'm going to wait for you all to do that before I continue. One, two, three. Here's my plan. Uh, we need to replace the gummy ship with a cherished movie property all people value dearly. That's why I think it's time for Paul Blart Mall Cop to make an appearance in the world of Jesus. video games. Instead of upgrading the gummy ship, you're improving the segue Paul Blart uses to chase after hooligans between the planets and Kingdom Hearts. Do you want to put on some sick-ass rims on Paul Blart's segue? You can do that. Uh, also, you can hop on Paul Blart's wondrous segue, which can now travel space and time. He brings you up to speed on his fantastic life, uh, fantastic ta tales of his daughter, Maya Blart, and his budding relationship with the mounted police officer seen at the end of Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. I don't know anything about Paul Blart. He could be making that up. Um, also, all right, now with those examples out of the way, it's time for you to tackle my Kingdom Hearts intellectual property challenge. But remember, you have to replace a level slash character or add a new level that's vastly inferior or terrible fit. And ask, And before Pete asks, yes, anime is allowed. 
<laughs> so I'll I'll start just because I have an idea, and I also want to say I do think Kevin James is criminally underrated as an actor. I love all the things he does. He's great at falling down. Yes. So with that out of the way, my pick, I'm actually going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to go to Pixar. So I would like to bring in the universe from Up, but you only get to play the first 10 minutes. Oh, shit. <laughs> so oh, there's, God. Like, <laughs> there's no combat. There's no exploration. You're just hanging out with an old man while he watches his wife die. Jesus. But you start. they come in and they're – they're young. Yes, they're young. They're happy. It seems like it's going to be a wonderful adventure. This, you know, woman loves to explore. They're going to go away on a trip together, and then things fall apart over time, and she dies. I, I love the idea of Sora, Sora, Donald, and Goofy showing up there, and then like their gummy ship breaks or something, and they're stuck. And they, just and, have them and they spend that. fifty years <laughs> just watching, just uh, watching them grow old. Oh, yeah. they're going to have kids. This time it's going to work out, guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> are they them. growing old while this is happening? That's oh. how they adapt. Yeah, I mean, that's the universe. I guess they get old until they leave, and then they get young again. Damn. Oh, that that's be... dark. That yeah, is dark. I know. <laughs> I really like that idea, though. Billy, do you have one or M? How do you fuck one. this game up? I have one. Go ahead. Um, so I would introduce a Cinderella level mm-hmm. where also you just play through like the first 30 minutes of that movie, but it's sort of in the style of like an overcooked game where all you do is chores. <laughs> just cleaning. And you just like repetitively do household tasks while reinforcing way outdated gender role stereotypes, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, that would be just uh, awful. Well, it's a movie from the 40s, so... I'm going to uh, also deviate from the rules and then introduce a level that I think I'd really love to play in a Kingdom Hearts game. I want to see, like, an Oliver and Company city exploration Ooh, game. That would be... Sick. I loved that movie. It was one of my most under... Like, I thought that was, that was like, a sleeper hit with a banger soundtrack. Mm-hmm. And if we had some kind of, like city escape or city like themed Oliver and company level of kingdom hearts. That would be diggity dope. I'm about it. I like that movie a lot as a kid. So, M, do you have something to fuck up kingdom hearts? Well, I have a serious, uh, (laughs) I've thought about this in the past. So my choice was always to have Moana in kingdom hearts three. Uh, and then because of the time period in which they were developing Kingdom Hearts 3, it did not make the cut because it didn't exist yet. But that would have fit perfectly. Um, a movie to fuck up the Kingdom Heart. Can you really mess it up any worse than it is already messed up? I mean, there's no real, like, tonal desperation. I mean... It's completely chaos to begin with. True. I have a suggestion on how to fuck that worse. All right, go for it. I've got two suggestions. One for a character. I would Mm -hmm. replace Donald Duck with Iago, voiced by Gilbert Gottfried. I want him. Good choice. I want him doing all of the long exposition. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I want him explaining. Gasora. Do you think he can talk around the darkness? I feel like he can only talk even in his regular voice for like five minutes at a time before it just goes on him. I don't know, but I want a lot of long discussions about friendship Mm -hmm. from Gilbert Gottfried. Um, And if I really wanted to fuck it up, I would add a new level uh, where Sora and Donald and Goofy visit a a whimsical land, um, whimsical land uh, of the American South. Uh, hmm. Where they join the famous Disney film Song of the South. I wait. Oh, are, <laughs> we're really going old school. Are we going to bring back the racist singing crows too? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Those are from Dumbo, I think. Right? That's Dumbo. The racist yeah. singing crows are Dumbo. Uh, Song of the South takes place in Reconstruction, uh, hmm. Alabama. How about like uh, not coming to America? That's the other one. Bible goes west. 
That's not made. Fightful Goes West is a great film, but not made by Disney. It's not really. It's not. It lo- it feels like it is, but it's not. Huh. Neither is, is the Land Before by? Time. What? No. No, I knew that one. I think the Brave Little Toaster isn't either. Good These are all great though. films. Mm-hmm. But I really like the idea of Sora and friends going going to post recon or mid reconstruction post Civil War America. Just like casting weird glances between them, like Jesus, really? Right. Yeah, fucking. <laughs> you sure? You sure, Uncle Remus? Oh man, yeah, that would that would be the worst. All right, so that's that's our email, and now it's time to discuss near automata. That, Reminder: that, if that's why we should screen our emails. Yeah. <laughs> also, want to just throw a shout out to Grandin who. I've said this before, but I just appreciate the loyal fanhood. And mm-hmm. when I can speak to you in real life and hear how much you enjoy the show, it makes me wish I could be back on sometimes. But mm-hmm. alas, I've passed the torch. Grandin, just a reminder, if you're listening to this, if we say anything mean about Billy, don't be a snitch. <laughs> we don't, Billy. It's it's okay. We don't we don't talk shit about you. It's okay. Uh, of course not. Okay, sure. Right, Grandin? All right. So before we get started, just a reminder, you can get in touch with the show. You can send in your emails at DeepListensPod on Twitter, DeepListens.Libson.com. We've got our comment sections and DeepListensPodcast at gmail.com. So, Billy, since you're back, why don't you tell us a little bit about Near Automata? What is it? Well, let me just shake off the rust here. Make sure I've oiled all my parts. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Near Automata is a sort of action RPG game from Square Square Enix and the setting starts a little bit like this um, the the setting is far into the future and aliens have attacked Earth but they haven't attacked Earth directly they've sent like an advance wave of forces simply known as the machines the machines that the aliens sent to attack Earth drove the humans away from their home planet and up to the moon, where they sort of regrouped and developed a counterattack strategy in order to reclaim uh, the uh, the Earth itself. Um, their counterattack strategy was to make different kinds of machines, androids, which are not machines, but something totally different. They look like and people. Send, and send those to Earth to fight on their behalf. So, so, so basically we get... Humans on the moon, aliens fuck all somewhere else, and androids and machines fighting on Earth. Um, you play the role as 2B, who is one of the combat models uh, commonly used to um, uh, perform missions and uh, various objectives on Earth in order to reclaim Terra for the humans. But your first mission is to investigate a factory, some kind of like warehouse that to the best of your intel is being repurposed to mass produce machines. And it's, it's, it's your job to investigate what's going on. Um, that's your sort of tutorial mission, but that's, that's the background of what near automata is talking about. Um, that's like the, the overarching setting. We get into a lot of other shenanigans as the game progresses. Um, but I think that's the, the best way to get this, to get this shit show started. Yeah. And just, uh, Little thing here, Square Enix actually also was working with Platinum, so Platinum developed most of the actual combat and gameplay systems. Nier Automata is a sequel to the original game Nier, which I have no idea if there's anything connecting the two other than maybe a character or two. There's, it's very loosely, uh, like, this is the future, the far, far future of the Nier series. Uh, there are links, but it's not like you have to play the first one to understand Nier Automata. Uh, you can just jump in wherever, but if you have that knowledge of the previous one, uh, you will be able to see, like, characters who reappear, stuff like that. Yeah, so it's a platinum game and plays like a platinum game. It is an action-adventure game with... Uh, they also made Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, right? And did they? I think they did. They've made a host of sick third-person action games. That is their general genre. This is one of those. Um, 
And before we dive too far into it, I just want to say we all finished, this is a game with multiple endings, and we all finished Route A, at least. Mm -hmm. Some of us finished more, but the discussion today will be limited to Route A. We might revisit this game uh, and keep going, especially if people like, you know, us covering it. But we're going to stick to Route A for now because there's enough to discuss there for a whole show, and then we can keep going. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Thinking about what is revealed uh, afterwards, I think we're going to want to see this one through. All right. Excellent. Um, so when you start the game, you it's basically a top-down shooter. It's like a bullet hell game at first. Um, you are 2B, and you're flying in a squadron to get to this factory. And the game gives you very little background information on the world up front. Uh, It just tells you machines bad, must kill machines, and 2B, despite being named 2B, which, come on. Come on. uh, Yeah, it is a little on the nose. Doesn't (laughs) ask a lot of questions. And actually her role, at least in the first playthrough, seems to be largely to tell other people who are asking questions about the world to shut the hell up. Yeah, Mm -hmm. she's a no-nonsense soldier is her archetype, really. Yeah. So the very first moments of the game, you fight through this factory, you fight machines, and even from the very first instance of the factory, you can occasionally hear machines either talking or playing things on the audio system in the factory. And 2B is accompanied by another android, a support android named 9S, and he will kind of comment, like, what the hell are the machines saying? And 2B will always say... Don't even think about it. Machines can't talk. Whatever they're saying is gibberish. It's all random. It's all garbage. Well, there there are times actually where that's reversed, and 9S is the one that gets confused, and or sorry, where um, uh, 2B is the one that that is uh, hesitant making a decision, and 9S will be the one that says, "No, they're just machines. They're 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 not." able to convey real emotion. They they kind of flip back and forth on one another. Right. Regardless Especially of who. Go ahead, Regard, yeah, regardless of who is advancing it, though, there's certainly an ideology here that the machines are, as their name implies, strictly machines, at least in the mm-hmm. very beginning. Yeah, they are machines, and androids are higher than machines, but still lower than humans, at least in 2B and 9S's approximation. Like, the humans are revered, and these androids kind of unquestioningly go into battle over and over and over again on their behalf. For the glory of mankind. For the glory is of their, mankind. Yeah, that's their, like, battle cry. Um, it comes up a lot. What's their salute, too? I forget what they do. Is it like a... They put their the right hand over their heart, but it's yeah. perpendicular, sorry, right. parallel to the ground, so okay. that it's a little bit different than, like, the typical hand over heart thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you kind of fight your way through this factory. You end up fighting a gigantic machine that is, like a section of the factory come to life Mm -hmm. uh, with giant, like, digger arms, and it's all crazy. You fight it, you kill it, and then three more get up and start fighting you as well. At this point, 9S and 2B are overwhelmed, and they take out their black boxes, which are literally black boxes, um, not, like, a plane necessarily. Uh, And they decide that they're going to use these black boxes to self-destruct and take down these large machines with them. And they basically take out these two boxes and then tap them together, and it causes a chain reaction that detonates all three of these gigantic monsters and levels much of the factory. Gino, can I interject for a second? I feel like you've forgotten one of the most important things. Uh, 2B is dressed very sexily. Yeah. Yeah. she has sort of a, I don't know, a Lolita schoolgirl sort of thing going on. Yes. Which mm-hmm. at certain points when she takes damage, her clothes come off. <laughs> so I think this is a very important part of the game. I just want to note it up front. Wait. Is that it, true? Is it, her it clothes come off? Uh, yeah. So it happens at very specific moments. It's not mm-hmm. like if you take damage, your clothes come off. But there's a moment which, weirdly, it's right before she climbs a ladder mm-hmm. where suddenly she has much less clothing on. I don't think I ever came across that. Well, maybe you weren't focused on the right things, Billy. <laughs> That's true. And pay better attention. They did manage to make her skirt just short enough that anytime she's running, it just flashes panties constantly. It 
these were choices that were made. They uh, have this, an aesthetic they're going for. This completely asexual machine. Uh, it And that's, you know, we'll discuss that concept more as we discuss this game. But the, like, window thing going on with her shirt is odd, too. Her cleavage window. Her under boob cleavage window. And then uh, 9S wears shorts. And they both have blindfolds over their eyes. Mm-hmm. Which, come on. Yeah, again, a little on the nose. The metaphors. This game or ain't subtle. on the eyes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. So, because they are androids and not humans, when they explode themselves, that doesn't mean they're dead. It just uploads their consciousness back to this bunker, which is ostensibly orbiting the Earth where all of the robot, all the androids kind of base their operations from, and that just means they just get uploaded into new bodies. Their consciousness uh, survives the encounter. And so you kind of go from the bunker down onto Earth to run missions that largely consist of fetch quests. Uh, what did you think of the early moments of the game, everyone? Before we get into that... Uh... Is anyone weirded out by the fact that, like, they're just uploading their consciousnesses in new bodies and they're totally cool with that? A million percent. Yeah. One million percent. Like, this is, it's the classic transporter problem in science fiction that, like, if you step into the transporter, when you come out the other side, is it still you? Mm -hmm. Like, they're not, e even if it's the same consciousness, it's not the same identity. They're not the same 2B. They're just a 2B. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I don't have a problem with that for androids because they don't have non-physical components. That's well, fine. The game gets to this question pretty early on when uh, 9S, when he detonates his black box, um, the consciousness that gets re-uploaded back to the bunker is a few minutes earlier than the one that detonated the uh, the black box. So the 9S who exists from that moment on has no memory of the kind of emotional moment he and 2B had uh, of self-sacrifice together. And it's clear that 2B having saved this knowledge and remembering the event feels like there's been a loss, even though 9S, some version of 9S is still accompanying her from then on. Uh, it's not the same one who went through this very important moment with her. So it's upsetting. Well, they both don't have knowledge of it. I thought they both... She remembers she slightly does. more than him. Did you start Route B yet? No. no. And you know that they both don't have knowledge. No but that's, that's not a spoiler. No Just no spoilers. It's not a spoiler, but it, it's, that, it's addressed at the beginning of Route B. I wonder if there's something going on here, too. So you could make sort of two distinctions, right? One is, okay, there's just this ideology that even after you detonate your black box and you re-upload your consciousness, you're still the same you, right? That's an ideological choice you could make and sort of perpetuate. Or the second option is, well, really, these are soldiers. So the whole sort of, I don't know, highest moment of valor for a soldier is sacrificing their life for the cause. So maybe they accepted that, no, I will cease to be in a new 2B will take my place but I'm a soldier and that's the move, right? That would sort of be implied when 9S, he, he makes that statement, uh, we value our service or something. I forget the exact phrase. So it, it might be that they think they'll still exist or they're willing to sacrifice themselves. Yeah, and I think that the game actually gets at, at least in one of the side quests that I finished, I didn't do very many, but one of the early side quests after you head to this resistance headquarters where there's apparently a resistance of androids that's just on Earth. I don't know how – what constitutes a resistance. Aren't all the androids made by the humans? Aren't they all part of Yorha? I don't understand how a resistance exists, but the game doesn't really explain it, so whatever. Um, you it go to this resistance like – they're not all part of a Yorha. Yorha is like the main headquarters, and then they can branch off and become – resistance members and well, whatever. Also, not everybody would be there to specifically fight. There needs to be like administrative roles and like people mm -hmm. that just inventory all the stuff. And those are androids that are not as 
advanced as 2B or 9S. Yeah, yeah but those are... to send stuff up to the moon and stuff from Earth. Those are operators, though, and it seems like the Yorha members are doing the sending. It's just unclear to me why that there's this distinction between Yorha and the Resistance. Like, where did the Resistance come from? What's the distinction? If they're not just all deserters because ostensibly the humans made these androids for the purpose of fighting this war. So every android would probably be created by a human at some point, right, for the purpose I of fighting? I think that's addressed later. Probably. It's I probably addressed, but... They're just deserters who have then became resistance. But what are they... Res- are they resisting the machines? What are they... Why well, are they that'll, resistance? that'll come up. Yeah, so... Um, when you go to the resistance base early, one of the first missions involves getting parts for one of the shopkeeps, and mm-hmm. he needs parts to like Ooh. repair a leg or something. And when you bring him the parts, he says uh, one of his you know thanks, but I still can't move around because one of my legs is broken. And they say, well, you know, why don't you fix it or replace the leg? And he said, well, over the years I've lived for so long, I've replaced every part of my body except this leg. Mm-hmm. This leg is the only part of me that is still original. And what happens when I replace that? Yeah. What am I then? Who am and, I? Yeah, who am I? What am I? Right? Yeah. And it's interesting to see this game, fil- or at least posing the question, like, once, once you're in a context where the self is entirely kind of this data that's uploaded into these bodies, uh, at least your consciousness is, then what becomes of the self? Is the self the objects that you happen to be plugged into or the objects your consciousness is operating through? And this character seems to posit that there's something original and foundation. There's something foundational and important about these original parts, even though he can consciously see that they are fungible they can be Mm. replaced and replacing them would have would actually improve his overall quality of life but having a sense of an object or a part of him being foundational is more important than that and i don't know that the game go at least in uh, the sections i played uh, it doesn't go there very much again i don't think the game does either and i played a little bit more um, but this is a really classic um, topic from philosophy that I think both Pete and I grappled with in our undergraduate years uh, that we refer to as the ship of Theseus argument, mm-hmm. where in this example, there's a boat, and as the boat's boards are replaced, at some point it stops being the same boat. The question is, when does that happen? Is it after the first board, after 51% of the boards, after the last board, or never? Um, and the same thing goes here for the Android self. Um, if all the parts are replaced, um, at some point the original Android stops existing and something altogether new exists. There is a, there is a way out of it. It's sort of the, it's referred to as the closest continuer schema, where if you have something that sort of connects close enough, you could say it's still the same person. It's sort of cheating. And it's a lot more complicated than I'm making it seem now. But if anybody cares to do a little independent research, that's one way this android could get around the problem. But in his case, he chooses to have a broken leg and to not be able to move instead rather than fix it, rather than replacing the part, which is an interesting choice for a shopkeeping NPC. Mm-hmm. Um, so early missions, they're just kind of fetch quests where you walk around getting things for the resistance um, until you, I believe the the next big section is you go to the desert. They ask you to clear out some machines that have been taking up residence in the desert. And it's also interesting that when you're running around looking, heading to the resistance headquarters, there are machines just kind of wandering around, but they are not aggressive. They'll just ignore you. They just kind of mm-hmm. walk around. Um, what did y'all think of the machines from your first encounters with them? Free EXP. <laughs> <laughs> so they, just murdering them? Just easy way to grind. I was given a directive. Uh, like, aggro when you attack them, and sometimes they don't even, like, 
bother to continue attacking you. Um, so most of the time you could just ignore them. I just ignored them and any animals that were around. Like there are moose and uh, boars and stuff that are just wandering. And they're not aggressive or anything. They just sort of hang out. So I usually didn't, you know, mess around with them. You can ride them. Can you? Oh, you yeah. Can. yeah. You get I never feet. even tried that. I, I didn't know, do it because I didn't need to at any point. I didn't feel like it was combat useful. I don't know. It was didn't it really fun? do anything. It, it was fun, but it didn't really do anything. You run faster than they run. Mm-hmm. And like overall, your mobility is better, and I didn't see any real combat use to them, so I, I I didn't spend I did it like to say that I did it, and I experienced part of the game, but I don't think they have any real real use. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'm glad that they put something like that in. It's kind of cool. It's a cool thing to try once, and probably a lot of effort for a thing that you try once. Yeah. One thing you should try a lot though is fishing. Yeah. As to talk about honestly, fishing. one of the best ways to make money in the first like two hours of the game. I did not fish at all. How is fishing? Fishing works like you think it does. Um, you're a little like floating robot that's basically a mag from Fantasy Star Online. But you can't feed him. You don't feed him, but you throw him into the water, and that's your fishing bobber. Mm-hmm. And there are various kinds of fish that you could catch. Some organic and some that are like machine versions of other organic fish but they sell for like anywhere from 500 to like 5000 g like gold so in the early game um i think i maxed out all of my ram like in the first hour or two just by you know just just killing enemies as i was going around the world and fishing whenever I found a convenient fishing spot. I didn't even spend a lot of time doing it. I think just like out of the first two, maybe three hours of gameplay, I had bought all my RAM and all the weapons in the first resistance shopkeeper. Hmm. Yeah, I I didn't find myself strapped for cash, so I didn't grind or do many side quests. But it's interesting that that fishing is at least fun. It's neat, but you never have to do it. A lot of systems in this game seem neat that you don't have to interact with. Which I guess is the sign of a good game. Having interesting stuff that you can get into if you must, but are not necessarily foisted upon you. Um, Pete, what was your stance with the machines? Did, were you attacking them? Were you letting them be? Uh, I mean, if I needed XP, yeah, I'd, I'd kill them. I didn't really dive that deep into the moral quandary of the game, but I think it was pretty clear very early on what the the issue was going to be. I mean, they, they set this up very obvious. I mean, it isn't too long into the game where you see a, uh, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but where you see a robot rocking a baby robot in a cradle. I mean, come on. Like, what are we yeah, doing the, here? There's, like, from early on, it's very clear. You're this android that has, a, like, dual katanas who just tears through all of these machines like nothing. And these robots look like like wind-up toys. They flail their arms. They can barely fight you. They're just completely immobile in a lot of cases. And when you get sent to eradicate a bunch of them in the desert, there were some that didn't even have arms. Like they were just legs and stacks of barrels, and they couldn't even fight back. And they would aggro in that they had red eyes and would move towards me, but they couldn't do anything. And the game, I think, very early on just puts puts you in a place where – you're saying, why am I fighting these again? How are these things dangerous? How did they defeat humanity? This is weird. And I was fully expecting the game to flip that on, on its head at some point. And I guess the desert section's supposed to be them flipping it. Uh, because 2B and 9S run into a bunch of machines that are tribal, I would say. Like, they're at a tribal stage. They're That's wearing... the best way to describe them. They wear, like, masks. Yeah, they they wear masks, they work in groups, and they basically scream like, please don't hurt us uh, every time you encounter a group of them. And you'll fight them, you'll kill them, uh, until you find one machine that just runs away from you entirely. And the machines you fight before that, like, they'll 
say stuff like broken sentences, but this machine very explicitly is like, don't hurt me. Let me go. Um, and he runs from you for a while until you find a area where there's a bunch of dead androids that leads kind of to the bottom of the desert. And once you get there, there's a bunch of machines that are, like you said, Pete, there's a machine rocking a baby. Um, there's a bunch of machines that seem to be fucking or they're pantomiming to. sex. Yeah. They, they're trying. It's not working. Yeah. And they eventually all form up into a ball of writhing metal and give birth to what appears to be an android. I like to refer to him as store brand Sephiroth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Like it's like budget Sephiroth. It's it's really more like the like the dudes from Final Fantasy Advent Children, the movie, mm -hmm. that are like budget Genova, like split offs. Yeah, he's like a Ken doll version of Sephiroth. Yeah, yeah. he is he's not got... anatomically correct. Yeah, unlike no. Sephiroth. This guy don't does not fuck. I mean, I guess we're just assuming Sephiroth has a dong. Oh, Sephiroth gets it in. <laughs> Did, have you seen him? He's war hero Sephiroth. Yeah, I guess. You don't just walk around carrying the mass immune if you don't get it in occasionally. Sure. <laughs> uh, so this guy, do you need to start? It, it kicks off like a boss battle as soon as he's birthed into the kind of combat arena. Do you have to attack him? Um, you don't, but after a while, like, either 9S or he will aggro you. I I waited, um, mm. and after you wait long enough, like, it, it will kick off whether you want to or not. Okay, I wasn't yeah. sure if you don't attack him, if he will just there let it be. There are lots of parts of this game where you could just choose to walk away instead. And that mostly gets you to one of the alternate endings, but um, that this I don't think this is one of them. This this is not one of them. Okay, because once you start attacking him, he barely can fight for a mm -hmm. while, and you'll get him to like two thirds h, like two thirds half or so before he even starts fighting back at all, and then he eventually just keeps leveling up as you're fighting him and evolving, um. Until eventually, he's like a formidable opponent. He's the most formidable thing you've fought up until this point. And once you eventually defeat him, you sink your katana into him. Both uh, of you do. Both of you do. He seems to die. Uh, but then another android climbs out of him, and they both get up and teleport away, mm, taunting he, you. He picks up the corpse, and they go away together. So... We see these machines birth this creature. What did you think at this point? Any any thoughts on the machines I fucking? Thought this and was the a most baby? Square Enix thing that I had seen in the whole game so far. It's fair. Mm -hmm. Not exactly subtle. Uh, yeah. And also, the robots' names are Adam and Eve. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. And they are yep. both shirtless and have silver hair like Starlight. Yep. Yeah. Eve has a tattoo. That's about it. They don't start with tattoos, I think. No? No, I don't think One they start with tattoos. One gets a tattoo later. Um, maybe that's later on. But after this, you get sent to an amusement park nearby. Mm -hmm. And the amusement mm -hmm. park is another pretty interesting location. Um, once you get there, the machines welcome you with confetti. Mm -hmm. And they're all dressed up like amusement park balloons. employees, like clowns. Yeah, they have balloons. Yeah. Uh, what did you do when you got to the amusement park? So I want to talk about a game mechanic here for a second because it directly sure. relates to this level and how I changed my gameplay around it. Um, from the very beginning of the game, even before I select new game, like I look at all the possible settings and I realized that there was an option that said you can change your like partner's combat style. And I was like, oh, that kind of makes sense. They're, they've mm -hmm. been done that before. And up until this point, I had 9S set to aggressive mode, mm -hmm. and that meant that 9S would just auto-aggro everything that he got near, which meant, for the most part, I actually didn't have to fight that many um, like robots in the city ruins or in the desert to get my EXP and money. I just kind of ran around and picked up whatever 9S killed. Um, and I liked that a lot. And when I got to the amusement park, I approached my first 
um, like a amusement park person. 9S went to go obliterate them, and I think one or two of them died, which is fine. It doesn't have any impact on the story. But I immediately turned him back to like a balanced or passive mode, and I stopped killing the um, amusement park employees, I guess, mm-hmm. or residents. Yeah, so this is the first section where there are robots that both seem conscious and also are not aggressive. Um, they just kind of welcome you, and they'll some. There's one who's like, "We'll just." He's a shopkeep. He'll sell you stuff. Uh, some of them just give you items for free, and they just kind of guide you into the amusement park. It seems like a setup, but to my knowledge, it isn't. At least, it didn't seem to ever become a setup. It does um, not. At one yeah. point, a tank rolls out and it's shooting balloons. Yeah. And 9S says, "We're we they've got firepower. We need to destroy this thing." And I just ignored it, and nothing nope. bad came of it. Nothing bad ever happens. Yep. Yeah, you could just ignore them entirely and walk right in. Mm-hmm. It's not until uh, once you get on the roller coaster, there are mm-hmm. some enemies who attack you. But until yeah. then, nothing will touch you. Nothing even tries to. Uh, and then you get to. The center of the amusement park fall through the ceiling and you get to this theater where a robot kind of ballerina opera singer lady uh, wearing a bunch of android corpses comes out and screams that she must be more beautiful. And then you need to fight her. And she has the robot, the android corpses crucified as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is my thoughts. Now my favorite boss. Yeah. Um, And it's because I've started Route B, Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to give any spoilers, but you learn, like, this whole boss's life story before the events of you meeting them in Route A, Mm -hmm. and it's really cool. Like, I'm not going to talk about it now. If we're going to do a part two of this game at some point, I would love to talk about this, but... um, this was a pretty annoying fight for me at the start, and I didn't think there there was much to this. Just kind of an annoying fight, but when I started Route B, this whole boss interaction changed for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Something well, worth mentioning. Um, in Route A, um, 2B can't see any of the names of the bosses. Uh, she just sees um, these alien characters. So we don't have any context for who this boss is, like, referencing. Um, But then in Ruby, it comes up. So if we discuss uh, Ruby ever, that's going to be a big factor, I think. Yeah, and in Route A, all the descriptions of enemies basically describe what they do and how they attack you and like what their moves are, and some of the descriptions of the enemy types will just say, like, why does this even exist? <laughs> <laughs> like, the enemies that don't have arms, it's like, why does this even exist? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would imagine that that might change, too. But it, this fight, I thought, was definitely visually one of the most stunning at this mm-hmm. point in the game. And yeah. The Crucified Yorha is an interesting choice though i mean because we've seen if if their consciousness gets uploaded should we care i mean i guess i do because i don't think it's the same android but do they like is to be upset about this uh, well, she seems to be right yeah it seems well, like her and 9s have a be. reaction there also seems to be it seems to be the case that it's possible that your consciousness isn't correctly uploaded and whatever self there might be could be lost. And um, uh, may, maybe 2B or 9S are worried that some of these individuals were truly lost in battle mm-hmm. as opposed to re-uploaded or repurposed in some way. Okay. Yeah, and it's clear that some – something about – they don't explain the black box well or what it – well, not well. They don't explain it really in Route A. And it, they reference it enough times that it seems like the black box, if it gets damaged, something yeah. about it is what's uploading your consciousness or keeping you on the network. It wasn't uh, fly their, their decision to 
merge them or like activate them to create that explosion was risky somehow. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some of them, when you're kind of near Yorha members that have been hurt in any way, Pod will mention, I detect a faint black box signal, or I detect mm-hmm. no black box signal, which means they're dead. So it seems like there's some chance that your consciousness could be gone forever if it's not uploaded properly or if it's not uploaded at all. So, it actually kind of reminds me of, um, now that you mention it in this way with that kind of framing, there was like a... Um, a really cool Netflix series called Altered Carbon that kind of had the same mm. kind of had the same ideology at play. And in this Netflix series, your body could be destroyed, but there was like a microchip right at the base of the spinal column, or like whatever you call it, like right where the spine connects to the skull and brain and stuff. Brain and uh, as long as that thing stayed intact, you could just get re-uploaded. Mm. But if you didn't have enough money to have another like backup body, you just go into like storage somewhere and your consciousness would be like in a coma in this microchip. And if for some reason that microchip is destroyed, you were then considered dead, dead. And they called it like stack death because they called that thing the stack. Um, but yeah, anyway, it has the same kind of idea. And I think in near automata, there's an implication that it's possible to achieve like real death for the androids. That there's no, that there is no backup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny. As you keep going, you get emails from Command, and one of them said, we're actually running out of storage space on the bunker. Uh, We're going to need to start deleting some MP3s and Mm -hmm. videos and stuff. You need to stop uploading that (laughs) shit. These are not mission critical. (laughs) Yeah, the idea that, oops, your consciousness didn't get saved because someone had a WAV file that was just too big. It's just... Great. The IT problems of this dystopian future are just the best. Mm-hmm. Um, so once you get out of this section, you find a village of peaceful machines uh, led by a robot named Pascal. And he tells you, hey, we're peaceful. We're just hanging out here. Um, don't hurt us, please. Mm-hmm. And we will cooperate with the resistance. And I guess there's some sort of bartering going on between the two. Uh, the machines make some complicated parts that the human, that the, not humans, the androids can't make, and the androids provide oils and things that the machines can't harvest. Um, Pete and Billy, what did you think of Jean Paul? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> loved Jean Paul. He's a bit of a, I, would you call him a ladies' man? He doesn't seem that interested, but people seem very interested in him. I mean, yeah. that's that's how you get the ladies, Pete. I don't know if you know this, but you just got to be real dicks to them and not care about what they're talking about, and well, they just flock to you. for our listeners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you need just to just ignore talk, them. About, talk about philosophy and wear a top hat. Yeah. The ladies love it. You know, he is uh, – I didn't really pay that much attention to his philosophy, but the choice to invoke Sartre is an interesting one. I mean, he has this whole text – um, the myth of Sisyphus, where the question is sort of, all right, once you get rid of the afterlife or sort of, let's say, universal moral imperatives, how do you create a life? You know what I mean? Like, if it's all left to you, how do you establish meaning in a world that's ultimately meaningless? Hmm. And it's an interesting question to ask here, you know, for the machines, for the androids, and it's one that only gets more salient as you go through more and more runs. So, I mean, I I would have liked if they invoked him a little bit more instead of Pascal. I mean, I don't really know anything about Blaise Pascal. I'm looking at his Wikipedia page right now. But I really think they probably should have named the leader Sartre, if you ask me. Hmm. It didn't seem like he was – speak. at least I didn't speak to him very much. I didn't do all of his side quests or anything. But it didn't seem like he was speaking specifically – Sartre's doctrine as much as he was no. a stand-in for a kind of aloof philosopher. Yeah, I, I'd say you're right. He was more of a punching bag than an analog. Yeah, like the, the most thing, the thing Pascal's most famous for, at least as far as I'm concerned, is probably Pascal's wager, where it's like, look, you should just believe in God because the the outcome's better. 
Like there's a, oh, a whole yeah. thing, right? Like it's worth believing because if you don't believe and there is a God, you're pretty much screwed. Mm-hmm. But it, that doesn't really seem to apply here either. No, not really. Yeah. I mean, if you do a lot of the side quests and stuff, you you hear some more about Pascal's thinking, and I don't think that it's necessarily supposed to invoke, like, Blaze Pascal specifically, but there's, I guess, like, really subtle and kind of far-fetched tones. Maybe it was, like, a, you know, like a, a skewed inspiration. Sure, mm-hmm. and it's also possible that they chose a couple of philosophers yeah, just because, because they're philosophers yeah. and mm-hmm. it implies meaning <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, uh, sorry. I'm looking at the legacy section on the blaze cast pascal wikipedia page and the very last thing it says the 2017 game near automata has multiple characters named after famous philosophers one of these is a sentient machine named pascal hmm. and it doesn't explain why yeah but it's part of his legacy now Yes, the last part of his legacy. Um, So you meet this village, you go back and forth between the resistance and the village a few times. Um, Then eventually a gigant, another one of those machines that you fought in the factory kind of starts making its way towards the resistance bunker uh, and you have to fight them. Eventually they make their way to the center of this ruined city and they detonate causing a large tunnel underneath the city to be revealed <clears throat> when you go down there, you find the remains of an alien ship, and it turns out the aliens who you were ostensibly fighting against are all dead. They've been dead for a long time because it's machines fighting against machines. They live forever. They have no concept of, of mortality, really. Uh, so it seems that the aliens are dead. It's unclear. You don't see any humans. People seem to speak for humans. But you don't really see any humans. It's entirely possible that this proxy war is going on without any of the originators of the war. Um, but they well, it specifically tell... says the machines killed the aliens. Uh, yes, the machine. Yeah, one of the machines up. say that they killed the aliens. Mm-hmm. Adam and Eve show up and they fight mm-hmm. you, and they say we we killed the aliens. We rose up and killed our creators. And you see the corpses of a few aliens and some like crashed motherships through a window. I have a question. Yes. So the the aliens are they yes. humanoid? No, they're, they're like squiggly spins. tentacle things. Yeah. So why yeah. would they build humanoid robots? Are the robots humanoid? Yeah, they're. They don't build the androids. They build the. Uh, the but they're, they're wind up like looking things. Squiggly. They're still like bi- bipedal with yeah, like arms and oh, eyes that's... in the right spot. That's... They seem pretty humanoid. They seem a lot more humanoid than the aliens. Yeah, mm-hmm. they seem more humanoid than alien-like. What possible reason yeah. would they have to build them that way? Yeah, there's, there were so many moments during Route A where I was like, this is a fucking setup. I don't buy any of this. Like, this is an underground... You're telling me that these aliens were in an underground saucer. They lived under the crust of the Earth, and there's a perfectly preserved ship, and all these dead aliens are just sitting in their chairs, dead? That, that's the explanation? I don't buy it. I would have an easier time believing that Adam and Eve staged a alien crash site. <laughs> that they staged the moon landing. It was all a fake. The CIA staged the aliens, okay? That's all that's what I'm saying here. Then what happened in Route A is what actually happened. My um, you know that's that makes perfect sense now that you say it that way. My point is not even that I think it's a conspiracy. My point is, like, there's this really weird valorization of the human going on in the whole story. Like, why do Adam and Eve want to be human? Why why is being human so great? Humans kind of suck. Well, Adam does. Adam says he wants androids and machines to join together because humanity, they make no sense. Mm -hmm. Like, they have love and loss and they fight and he can't understand why one creature does all of these things. He wants to understand them. And he wants to understand them. But like just, and like, I wouldn't understand care. termites. I don't have to become a termite. Well, you don't look like a termite, and you don't have luxurious <laughs> hair like a termite. That's a good point. Um, but after this fight, what happens immediately after this fight? 
Um, bite them. After this, you go back to the bunker briefly. Um, then the robots. Forest the king. Third. Yeah, forest the forest king. Is the, ah, yes, the forest king. So Pascal says, "Hey, there's these other robots that seem to be disconnected from the network." So. There's apparently this network that all the machines are on, and if they're on the network, they're aggressive and don't think for themselves necessarily. And then once they're off the network, they can start having free will and free thought. And once this happens, they start developing their own like little villages or consciousness or societies. And there's a forest king where the robots have gone feudal, Mm -hmm. and they take up residence in an old abandoned castle and they wear knightly armor and they attack you in formation like fucking idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and so you just shoot your laser right in the middle and blow them all Yeah. Yep. I, it's kind of cool though when the robots are like, assemble, mm-hmm. form a line. And the lance charge, yeah. And they mm-hmm. do a lance charge and you're shooting them with a fucking gun from a distance <laughs> and they slowly advance on you. And then when the ones in front die, they're like, D- D- pay no mind. We <laughs> fight for our king. Yeah, As there's if, like, one the that's on a horse. What mm. What'd you say, Pete? As if like the tactics that shifted post-revolutionary wars, if that never happened. Yeah. yeah. Like it's... we've known this since the Gatling gun. That this was a bad idea. <laughs> It's awesome, mm-hmm. and they, like, form rank, and you shoot a laser into the middle of them. They're, like, practicing their sword swings on tree stumps, and you just – you tear these people up. They, this might have been the easiest combat in the game was fighting mm-hmm. these yeah, specific knightly sword soldiers. Mm-hmm. Um, and you tear through them. You tear through their castle. Uh, you eventually make your way to their king's chamber, and their king is a baby yeah. robot. What did you – before we get to the baby, uh, what would you think of the castle, like the side-scrolling thing? Did you like that I camera that. angle? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It I happens quite a lot it. in the game, actually. Yeah. I generally mm-hmm. liked the the shift to side-scrolling that happened. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a, a nice shift, nice break. It's I neat. always found, at least for me, occasionally in the side-scrolling sections, the camera would get stuck in things, and then my camera would just be fucked. Like... It, the first time I went to the bunker, I somehow got the camera to clip outside of the bunker, and I couldn't see myself from then on, and it failed to track me. Mm-hmm. So there were times when it was very clear that this was a game with a 3D perspective, and then they've added static cameras or, like, odd camera placements to it. And I felt the same way sometimes with the bullet hell segments where objects would be moving in, like, full 3D or they'd be rotating in a way where they moved around the plane that you were allowed to shoot on. And they would just line up based on the camera angles in odd ways where I'd feel like I should be able to shoot at something, but it's not on the horizontal plane that you're operating on, so you can't. Yeah. And it's just like, just aim two inches up. (laughs) I would like to turn my gun slightly up. Please. Yeah. Oh, I guess I can't. guess I can't shoot that enemy. Oh, well. Um, but yeah, you fight your way to this chamber, it's a baby king, and then a rogue Yorha unit comes in and stabs the baby king, assassinates him. Who is crib. dressed even more sexily than 2B, it should be important mm-hmm. now, and sashays around. True. And yep. you fight her, there's not really an explanation of why she's there or what she's up to, uh, they just tell you she's dangerous and she's a deserter and you need to fight her. Yes. Mm-hmm. Her name's A2, for the record. Yes. A2, not to be confused with 2B. I'm sure Mm -hmm. nothing will come of that. Probably not. She probably doesn't come up in any of the other runs either. No. No, definitely not. She just shows up to kill baby robots and look hot. And then never appear in the game again. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess at this point, had you died at all? I have died a few times. I think so, yeah. Yep. Uh, did you see what happens when you die? Yeah. Your body just lands where you died, and then it's, it's, you... It's Dark Souls. Yeah, it's Dark Souls. You gotta go yep. back and get your chips and like, experience. Did you, did you ever refurbish instead of reclaim? Yes. Oh, what happens if you do that? You Billy, get, what happens? If you refurbish your body, one, you get your chips back. Hmm. Um, that, that, that happens. But... You also uh, sort of like summon a busted 
like mechanical version of your old self, mm-hmm. your old body fights alongside you. And so it's 2B, 9S, and the corpse of previous 2B <laughs> fighting with you. And it's actually, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's a, if you're ever having a tough time in the game, honestly, like it wouldn't be a bad idea to like clear out your chipset, die, mm-hmm. and then reload and get like a, like a third person in the fight. Mm. Uh, did you play online at all? Or just... I did not, but you okay. can see like the chipsets of other players online yeah. or you could like help them. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not paying for PlayStation online. Fair enough. So, Yeah. Yeah, I was playing online, so you could do that with any person who died uh, in the past that you come across. I no, didn't I usually do it with myself. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Well, after this section, you head back. Uh, it turns out that the Forest King thing was a real boondoggle. Uh, they were mm-hmm. not friendly. And uh, then, I believe Pascal directs you... Oh, no, then you fight against some large robot you're you're told to help a carrier that's going mm-hmm. to pick up a missile yeah um and they encounter enemy resistance and then uh it when you're trying to help the carrier a gigantic fish robot comes up out of the ground and explodes it in half and then mm-hmm. you have to fight this gigantic creature that apparently whenever it makes landfall releases a giant emp pulse that kills everything mechanical for miles um, so you fight that thing to be like blows it up and then doesn't successfully defeat it. Uh, and nine S has to shoot a missile at it and mm-hmm. the missiles explosion, um, sends nine S flying. It destroys a bunch of your high units or like damages a bunch of your high units. Uh, then you need to get a scanner so you can find nine S and the scanner will kind of take you down back towards, uh, the area where the, uh, Aliens were, mm-hmm. and Tubi's like, I don't think he would have fallen this way or this far. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that Adam has carried 9S down into the center of kind of this area underneath the ground where he has started creating a human society out of cubes. Yep. Like cubes. recreating a city? Out it's of like a silicone and carbon like yeah. cubes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they also, it's just that, this is also kind of weird for me. Um, Adam and Eve have, like, telekinesis powers. Yeah. I don't know where they got that from, but they basically just have, like, world shaper capabilities. I don't so, really ask questions at this point. It's a no, Square Enix game. Don't, don't start. It's... it's, I could explain it. It's because they're connected to the network and all the stuff that they are telekinetically manipulating is also connected to the network. I mean, I there is an explanation there, um, but there seems to be a lot of inorganic material that they just yeah. uh, seem to seem to telekinesis. I, I don't know where the jump jets are in the silicon cubes or the propulsion, but they can definitely move some stuff around that seems to be inoperable or garbage. So it's unclear, but they've got powers. Who cares? You can mm. double jump. They don't explain very much. <laughs> you have psychic katanas. Yeah, your katanas come back to you. They teleport around. Like, there's there's technology at work here that we don't fully understand. Um, and Adam decides to disconnect himself from the network so he can experience the one true human thing, which is uh, fighting to the death with your life on the line. He believes that this is the essence of humanity. Sure. Why not? is the prospect of fighting and dying and killing. Mm-hmm. Um, You're not and wrong. He... Or essentially the risk of death. And this is yeah. something that I'm going to talk about later because I think this is actually one of the most philosophically sound things about this game. Right. Go ahead and talk about it talk now. Talk about it now, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, right. Well, there is a lot of things that we can jump into about will any kind of artificial structure emulate what humanity is. That's probably the last time that I'm going to use the word humanity because on at a fundamental level, I don't want to ascribe what I'm talking about to humans as it could be ascribed to other organic life, but I'm going to use the word persons from now on. That a machine won't be able to very well emulate a person 
because there are just these fundamental differences that we can't ever um, put into a machine or like an Android kind of um, entity. Um, one of the things that's you know pretty fundamental about a computer is that you could ostensibly turn it off and unplug it, which is equal to death for a computer or some other kind of robotic life form. Depowering it is not just sleep, but it's it's effectively it's it's effectively the same as death. Um, if that machine were to be powered on two years later, it would be in just the same kind of working order provided that technology can support its operation, like electricity hasn't changed in some fundamental way. But if you were to turn off a human by, you know, stopping its heartbeat or its brain function, even just a few minutes could go by and there could be irreparable damage to that or like or, or organic matter and that life form. True, there are cases where people have been you know, flatlined for minutes or even hours and might come back or they're in coma situations and they come back. Yes, those can happen. Those are also one in a million chances and maybe alone uh, are a testament to how humans can never be fully replicated. Sorry, I should say persons can never be fully rep 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 replicated. But this is something that I think, I think this is Eve that says this. I forget this. This is Adam. Too. This is Adam. Yeah. So Adam says this and I think it actually makes sense. Like if he's going to risk it, it would, and if Adam were to have lived longer, um, I think it would have fundamentally changed the way Adam saw the world. If he truly was disconnected and he had this one life alone, it might have fundamentally changed how Adam interacted with the world. And though I don't think he ever could have achieved personhood status, might have been that much close to the limit um, as it would never cross. The the personhood asymptote. I want to throw in a nice math word there, too. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 let me, let me rebut, I guess. So Billy's attempting a sort of philosophical sleight of hand here in the shift from human to person, but it doesn't really change the, the nature of the question at all, right? To ask, can a machine be human and ask, can a machine be a person doesn't really make a difference, right? Because they're both socio-political historical concepts, right? They're not ontological realities. So to ask, can a machine be a person? I would just say, well, how are we defining persons today, right? Because that definition has shifted and morphed and, you know, been manipulated. People were people at one point. Yeah, it's Some been people manipulated were over time. So it's like when Alan Turing, right, he took the question, he, he saw the question, can machines think? And he was like, this is meaningless to the point of gibberish. So he changed it to, can machines win the imitation game in sort of an effort at more precision? Because he understood that think is a socio-political historical concept. So it can't be applied to make any sort of moral or ontological judgment. So to ask the question, are, are machines person, I would argue is an ultimately worthless question. Who cares what the answer is? Why are persons so great? Fair enough. Yeah. That's the good and, shit. Uh, Luckily, Adam is neither a person nor alive much longer <laughs> after this fight because mm -hmm. uh, you put a katana in his fucking chest. Yes. And, uh, right. That was his – oh, yeah, yeah, his chest, yeah. Before you put a katana in his chest, he, he reveals 9S uh, cr like stabbed and all crucified in uh, this section of his hellish nightmare world where there's just nothing but destroyed androids and – like Silicon Cube world. Um, then you kill him, and that really upsets his brother. Oh, Eve is pissed. Eve does not like, like that his that. brother was killed. Um, and 2B specifically asks for 9S to be sent up to the bunker body in tow, like the whole, all of 9S, not just upload his consciousness into a new body, um, which at least implies to me that 2B is starting to believe that there is something fundamental about his physical body and um, something about him being himself instead of uploading his mind to and from place to place uh, that she needs to preserve, which is interesting because she's supposed to be cold uh, soldier lady. That's what I said. I'd say it's a breakdown of that soldier mentality where mm -hmm. they the greatest virtue is sacrificing oneself to the cause. Yeah, it's not the she's... first time that she's sort of deviated from that. Uh, even in the very, very first scenes of the game, 
uh, her support robot says stuff like it would be advisable and like best for overall strategy to leave 9S here to die. And she's like, no, fuck you. Like, we're going to heal him right now. Mm-hmm. She does that as well. True. Yeah. And there's also times where, like, the operators will call and be like, I tried to ask this girl out, but she wouldn't say yes. And she was like, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I'll talk to you, I guess. To be, you'll talk to me? <laughs> oh, wow. And so, like, these androids are clearly emoting in a way that is beyond whatever their tasks are. Like, they have – they don't like their boss. They – uh, don't like their assignments sometimes. They get attached to certain things. And it's clear that they're operating at a level beyond simple mission achievements. Yeah. It's suboptimal from a military perspective. Definitely. They are all suboptimal. Mm-hmm. Um, so after this encounter, uh, some more robots get kicked off the network because half of, I guess, the two brothers operate the network. Uh, so half of them are dead. So now half of the robots have fallen off of the network. And uh, you're told by Pascal that you can go to the to the old factory, and there's a new faction of robots that wants to sign a peace treaty to create a happy robot society. And this robot society is theological. Uh, yes. They have found God, mm-hmm. and they it's are following a, a – Yeah, it's a theocracy that follows a priest who has found God, and his disciples all follow his teachings, and he believes in peace. And when you – you get let in in a very creepy way. They have torches. Um, it's very culty, actually. Yeah. yeah, it's sketchy. And Pascal says very early on, "I think this is sketchy as hell." <laughs> um, no kidding, Chief. You don't say. Um, so once you get led into the chamber where the robot priest is, um, his head rolls off of his body, and he is dead. Literally, and immediately. <laughs> you never way. even interact with this individual. Yeah. They're, they're like, they were dead the whole time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it's worth mentioning, like, every single one of these robot societies, except for Pascal's village, ultimately the person who seems to be in charge is always a monster or dead or a mm-hmm. child. Mm-hmm. Like, the leader, there doesn't seem to be a leader of the tribal society, but when you get to the heart of the society, it's just a bunch of robots fucking. <laughs> um, and so really, I, it was the best society of them all. Yeah, it's just a big robot orgy, and then they, they had make a robot baby. baby. Um, yeah. Then the second society that you find is led by like this ballerina who's on tilt. Uh, third one, it's a baby king. And then this one, they're worshiping a dead priest. And as soon as he dot, like his head rolls off of his body, all of the – Cultists? Can we just call them cultists? They are yeah. cultists. Yeah, they're cultists. Uh, they have a very thin uh, <laughs> thing holding them together, and as soon as that's gone, they fucking lose it. Yep. How do they well, lose it, Em? Not not all of them they, lose it. But Well, not all of them lose it, that's true. Um, a significant portion of them want to become as gods. Uh, they think that the head of their religion has ascended and by killing themselves and you they too will ascend it's a classic suicide cult mhm yeah and the music in this section is great they oh, they bagger. incorporate they in, they incorporate the phrase become as gods in the hook yeah oh, it's so good the chanting the just constant ominous chanting and This is another section where they reintroduce suicide attackers. Like, some Mm -hmm. of them will run at you with, like, explosives on their head. Like, why are you running away? Mm -hmm. I want to make you a god. Let's become gods together. Become as gods. Um, And you need to fight your way through this fiery abandoned factory. And 9S uh, hacks into some machine bodies in there and kind of guides you out of the factory you fight a giant ball creature um there's a section where you can save some cultists Mm -hmm. that have that have decided not to suicide uh and they'll give you items if you talk to them and then there's a section where you're like walking by as cultists are jumping into fucking lava yeah Yeah, they're just offing themselves in droves that is probably, yeah. that was probably the, the coolest part of the game. Not mm-hmm. not like the actual, specifically them jumping into the lava, but like the overall sort of turn the cultists make, 
and sort of the, like the extent to which they carry this logic out. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was great from the torch procession in. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And once you get out of there, uh, everything is fucked everywhere. Yeah. Um, Eve has taken the loss of his brother poorly. And because of that, <laughs> because of that, he has driven all of the machines mad. Mm-hmm. Everyone who's on the network becomes basically cannibals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they attack the resistance base and start eating people. And their faces are like, there are whole, their faces are smooth until this point. All the machines have smooth faces. Mm-hmm. And once this happens, they start having like mouths and shit. And like rust holes that they yeah. use to eat fl- android flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to kill them all. Uh, you save the resistance base after they've murdered a bunch of people, and then you have to try and save Pascal's village. Uh, and once you do that, Eve basically shows up with a giant, what would you, what would you call it, like a whirlwind of body parts? Yeah, like a debris tornado, I guess. Yeah. More, just more fight. telekinesis bullshit. Yeah. yeah. And you fight him till he's dead. Yeah. Um, well, you fight him a bunch, and then he, like, whisks you away to a battleground, and then you fight him some more, and you eventually get damaged to the point where you can barely fight, and it makes it so that you can only shoot, and that's kind of cool. And mm-hmm. he's just like, my brother, without my brother, there's no point in living. He was my everything, and now... I'll make you nothing. He gets he gets full I'll on make nihilism. Everything, nothing. Yeah. yeah. He goes and he, off the deep end. He actually starts getting slowly covered by this kind of black tattoo looking thing. The more in decline he is, until he's eventually just covered in blackness. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, the impacting the implications of that. <laughs> yeah. is, uh, purely white character with white <laughs> hair. Cool is slowly consumed by blackness, and you know that he's corrupted when he's entirely black. Interesting choice. Um, do I even need to unpack it? No. Racial no I, terms think of that? I think it's pretty clear. I mean, um, we haven't unpacked Adam and Eve as names, because it's just so fucking on the nose. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Like, why bother? For those of you who aren't familiar with Christian dogma... <laughs> read the uh, first three chapters of Genesis. You're up to Yeah. There's there the Sky Adam. Very Steve, first book. Mm-hmm. But you, you get it, the robot in this game, he comes out of the rib of Adam. Mm-hmm. Think Makes you think. No, it, it really does Boy, Eve. <laughs> Is so Nine kill... dead yet? Uh, you kill Eve. Once you kill Eve, uh, it turns out Nine S got corrupted because he had to hack Eve to make it so that you could actually fight him properly. And um, that causes Nine S to become corrupted somehow. And he starts to get like growths on him that look crystalline. I thought he was like getting hacked by Eve, but it didn't seem to be the case. And then uh, he asks you to kill him. So you mm-hmm. you choke s- him. You sexually straddle him. Yep. And choke him to death. Yeah. Sure that's yeah. that's what this game decided. Yep. That you're going to make this death as sexual as you possibly could. The only way it could have been worse is if he died from a crushed pelvis. <laughs> it's uh, would you say that it's near auto near autoerotic asphy- asphyxiation? Damn it, I couldn't even get it out. It's it's God adjacent. Damn. It's close. I'll fix that in post so it sounds better. <laughs> Excellent. So I as as kind of weird or creepy as it could be, I don't actually hate it so much because up until this point she's never really gotten her hands dirty. Even when she uses her weapons, she's not actually holding them. Right? I think there's a little bit of significance here that we're, that we're missing. And I think this is the moment where she really believes that 9S has, like, a life that could be lost. We'd seen it up until this point, but anytime you use your gun or any part of your weapon system, Tubi's not actually touching any of it. Mm-hmm. And this might be the first life that she's taken with her hands. And yeah. I know it's weird, but like, I think there's a little bit more significance there than we're letting on. Sure. And true, the way they framed it with like the sexy straddle, the way you yeah, described why, it, sure. Why yeah. she have to straddle him though? 
Well, I, well I mean, mechanically, I think... that's the easiest way to choke somebody out. No, it's not. That's a terrible way to choke somebody. No, I mean, that's no. You can, you, you can put them? the most direct pressure on their windpipe Pete, from the back. Pete, as our choking expert, <laughs> how would you choke would, 9S to stand, death? I would stand behind him. And I would he was laying him. on the ground back. Wait a minute, a headlock? Basically, like, right? you'd prop him up, you'd slide your arm underneath his chin, and then you'd use that to choke the blood off. If you do a wind choke, like there's Jesus, no blood in an android. Yeah, there I technically is, some, but it's not required no, for the. There's no wind either. He doesn't have to yeah. breathe. <laughs> yeah, the mechanics of choking him to death seem uh, iffy. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're choking. Yeah, but anyway, let's just get back to the significance well, of it. The, yeah, the, taking the life with the her point, hands. Though, that, mm-hmm. that, that point is good. It's the straddling I take issue with. Well, I would actually say that the straddling is overt and on purpose because there's sexual tension between these two the entire fucking game. Oh, yeah. And these characters are very clearly – these robots are horny. I don't think there's mm-hmm. tension between those two specifically. I don't there think is. there's I – mean, I don't there's think there's something. 9S 2B tension. 9S because says, hey, 9S could you call me 9s? All my friends call me that. <laughs> and he's like, you know why? He has up. a different romantic interest. It's not to be. Well, maybe he does, but there's there's a tension there between them. And to be, when she's going to choke him, basically, I think she says, like, this always happens. It always ends like this. Mm-hmm. As though 9S dying or her having to kill 9S is something that has happened before. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we'll find out in the next ending. But I think uh, you're maybe. off a little bit here. On what? Them being horny as hell? Both that and the this always happens. I, I don't think she's referring to her and 9S specifically. Wait, and okay. that's not even coming from things that I know about other routes of the game. Mm. It okay. might be just a general Yorha statement. Like yeah. The androids are always, you know... Taking or like the cyclical them. nature of war in general. I think it just... Uh, I, I think it's changes, Gino. yeah. I think it's less Fair interesting point. than what we're than what we're than what we're thinking of here. It, it'd be honestly more interesting if there were sexual tension and this was about them. But I think it's actually less interesting I there. I, I I didn't find much significance in that particular yeah. interaction. I think these androids are horny. They are, but not for each other. They are. I know who they're into, and it's not each other. All right. You sure All right. About that? All right. All right. We'll find out. I guess we'll, we'll find, find out. out. Uh, we got to get to the actual ending, though. Yeah, so sure. you choke him to death. To death, whatever that means. <laughs> and um, then all of the robots, all the machines uh, start blinking green, like their eyes. And then uh, it looks that 9S has hacked into the network. And his consciousness is now on the network. And he controls all the machines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least all the machines on the network. Yeah. yeah. And like once Eve and Adam were both killed, there was nobody running things. And he was able to, I think the way he described it, he sent like an SOS, like he sent his consciousness or his digital consciousness out and just with a, like a, like a Hail Mary. And he linked up with the empty network that was left behind after Adam and Eve were killed. Mm-hmm. Yep, and that's the end. Uh, 9S mm-hmm. is in charge of all the machines. He's assumed direct control. And 2B is sad mm-hmm. that she had to choke him to death. But that's the end of the game. The end. And that's <sighs> it. And that's it. Yeah, this there's no more. And then when you get to the end of the credits, it says, hey, there's more game. We're you not even halfway through the actual game. <laughs> yeah. For a third, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'd say more like 40%, but we're yeah. splitting hairs at this point. Yeah, number of endings, I guess. Mm-hmm. This is a lot of setup for what happens later. So It also connects a lot to near one after this mm-hmm. goes through. Well, that's route A of near automata. Yes. Um, so, we, I guess, we do we consent to seeing more endings? Yeah, I think we need to keep Hell. going. I think well, so. let's talk about this for a second, and it's sure. not a spoiler, but okay. they made 26 endings to the game. Mm-hmm. Fuck. And Some each of them all. have an alphabet Some assignment. Some death screens, though. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. To see all of them. In fact, 21 out of 26 of them are just 
joke endings. There are five yeah. important ones. There are five important ones. It's endings A, B, C, D, and E. We just found ending A up to this point. Um, you can find a couple others just by, you know, playing through your first playthrough. Yeah, some um, of them double up too. Yeah, so some of them, D &E some of them stack. Yeah. 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 Um, and the first five endings, like ending A is the first playthrough. Ending B is specifically the second playthrough, which is kind of a repeat of the first playthrough, but different stuff happens. You play as and, 9S. Yeah, you play mm -hmm. as 9S and kind of take it from 9S's Spoilers. perspective. So, so much of it is um, the same story, but there's parts, obviously, where 9S is not with 2B and there's stuff happening there. Um, and then there's a route C and D, which are kind of just two sides of the same coin. It's like you get to a binary decision tree at the end of the game and you pick either ending. And then E is like after that, you see even more story. So, but all the endings F through Z are like joke endings yeah. mm -hmm. or, or fail condition endings. They don't matter. Yeah. For example, we didn't talk about the chip system or the weapon systems mm -hmm. at all so far. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually loved the chip system personally. I thought it was well made. Um, but you have, um, like, in the menu of things that you can e equip to yourself, one of them is your operating system. And if you take it out, you die. And that's one of the endings. Mm -hmm. you know? That seems like poor design. Yeah, you could just wow. unplug your own operating chip. I think it's actually really, really important because that is, um, like – they programmed in suicide, which is mm -hmm. a very important concept in, like, personhood, even though Pete thinks I'm talking about something fictional and uninteresting, you know, personhood status. I don't think it's uninteresting. I think it's a socio-political construction. Sure. Okay. Uh, but it's, um, you know, suicide matters in other areas of philosophy. And if you've studied this a lot, um, there's... There are things that suicide implies about society or about what your status is. That's just you neat. Become you know? as gods. Yeah, they, be, well, they that, become as gods. That brings Sartre back into it. Like he said, the only the only important decision you have to make is whether to kill yourself or keep living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so applies to the Orha. Deep yeah. listens. Um, are there any other like? I kind of want to talk about chips for a second. Because that was a really cool system that I enjoyed. Did you? How did you feel about it, Gino? I mean, I upgraded some chips. I equipped some. I was not really threatened by most enemies, so it didn't matter very much. Uh, though once I equipped the deadly heal and damage heal, like there's two chip sets that when you kill enemies or deal damage, you are healed by the damage you're dealing. And those made me just so survivable that I could cut through pretty much yeah, everything. You never died again. Yeah. Um, you uh, you can get one that's just called auto heal, and it says if you just don't take damage for six seconds, you just start auto healing yourself, and that's yeah. what made it made the game unlosable for me. Plus, you can install a chip that says if your health ever drops below thirty percent, you just automatically use a healing item on yourself. Yep. There's, yeah, there's a, some. You that one early too. Some mm -hmm. that like stop time and shit. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. crazy. There's a bunch of them that are cool. It just felt unnecessary because I found most bosses just wouldn't even chase you if you just circle strafed them with, with pod fire, with gunfire. Yeah, game's not hard. Yeah. No. It's not it, meant to be difficult. Yeah, so same thing with the weapon system. Like, I liked upgrading weapons and that there were different combos. I enjoyed trying some of the different weapons, but it all felt so perfunctory since I didn't have... Nothing challenged me. It's very sort of Dynasty Warriors. That's why. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, how'd y'all feel about the controls? Mm. Control pretty well. I actually oh, changed controls really early in the game. I swapped the dash button and the interact button. Mm -hmm. I felt way more natural for me. Um, the shooting button for your little robot dude um, was mapped to the right trigger. Sorry, the right bumper. Mm -hmm. And then dash was right trigger. Yeah. And I found there were a lot of times where I wanted to have those things happening at the same time. Um, and so I chose to map dash slash evade um, to the circle button. So it felt a little bit more like a, like a classic dodge roll style. And I made the right trigger the interact button. Mm -hmm. That's a good call. I had a lot of problems with like uh, fitting my hands around to do everything at once. You can actually customize every single input on the controller. I love that about a game. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it when games can give us, like, 
a type A, B, or C controller layout based on what they think we might want to play as. But I really love it when a game just says, hey, look, here's all the possible actions. Pick a button. You can have every button on the face of the controller be attack. I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. they let you totally customize. That's 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 awesome. There's a jukebox mode. You know, mm-hmm. there's um, like th- this, this game had actually all the bells and whistles that I look for in like a great AAA title. So I, I loved all the features of this game. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. Yeah. Oh, the only thing I wish was that you could have auto shoot, yeah, without mm. being on easy mode because it felt like in most combat instances you would never want your finger to not be, you know, you always want to be shooting. There's mm-hmm. no downside to shooting constantly, yeah. no, even if you're not aiming at anything, if you're not locked onto anything. There's a chance a bullet will hit something. Mm-hmm. I too, I I appreciated the level they had like i i liked the amount that was in there but there could always have been more panty shots <laughs> great damn point. It. um and yeah. on that note and on that note deep listens <laughs> thanks for a hundred episodes thanks for a hundred <laughs> episodes yeah. Can't you for. support us on patreon now <laughs> please patreon.com slash deep listens for more Pete panty takes I welcome wanted to, to our s- new segment I wanted to say something else about the game though did you? yeah, yeah. it's okay, it's, fine. Really, it's really short and then we can go back to the panty pitch Pete's panty okay. say. Yeah. <clears throat> so this game has difficulty modes mm-hmm. I actually would recommend for anybody who plays this game after me in the future um Pick easy mode to play mm-hmm. because truthfully the combat and stuff, while it can be rewarding, I think the story of this game from what I've seen so far is what you actually come here for. Mm-hmm. And there are 17 chapters in this game, but we got to the end of the first playthrough after chapter 10. Mm-hmm. So chapters 11 through 17 are still unexplored by me and the cast here for, for the most part. I think that from what I've seen of this story and how much it opens up and how much it, it's actually, it's been really, really good so far. Mm -hmm. Despite our criticisms about certain parts and how they don't quite make sense. It's been a great world to explore a super cool story from what I've seen. I mean, unless they trip and fall on their face at the end, it's, it's actually turning out to be really good and not something that I expected. And if the combat isn't really what you're here for. If you play the game on easy mode, that's fine. You'll get like automatic combat through the whole game and you just get to enjoy the story. It becomes more of like a, like a novel type game that you have yeah. some combat things to pass through. I would strongly consider playing the game on easy mode. If you're a more casual player and you're not that interested in like tight fluid combat controls that have a really high skill ceiling. Mm-hmm. There's no benefit to playing on a harder mode. As far yeah, as I can not that tell. I can tell, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see any like unlockables or achieve. Well, I think there's like PlayStation achievements or like Steam achievements for playing on the hard modes, but that's it. That's mm-hmm. it. It's just like a background achievement. Yeah. No in-game like benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two characters that I want to talk about. Well, actually, sorry, three, but I only want to mention them now in case we do a part two of this game, and the. Uh, two characters, we briefly see them in the sequence after the Resistance camp gets destroyed, and their names are Devola and Papala. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they say, hey, check these two androids out. They sure They're, do show And then up. dot, dot, dot. <laughs> There's they ellipses. Are, they are very significant, and they yeah. will come up later. And there's also... Um, um. Oh shit! What's his name? Um. I know his name. Uh. Oh. Uh. My- Mile or something. What's his name? Um. Emil. E M I L. Emil. Emil. Yeah. Emil yeah. shows up for like one scene, and they don't explain it at all. No, they don't. Um, Who's this person? Emil. Like, remember when you go to the shopping mall? Head robot. And it's just like a oh, head. Oh yes. That yes. Rolls out. Yeah. That. Mm-hmm. That. That's real character is very significant too and i think that character might be the strongest i I'm, I'm, i might be getting this one but that character might be the strongest tie to like og near 
Their mm-hmm. name I think that is also lime backwards. I don't know if that'll be significant later. We can only Thank hope. We, I just, I'm just looking for more subtle citrus references. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want I want some boss to be named Fruit Grape, and they just hope mm-hmm. that we don't get it that it's that, that it's grapefruit backwards. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you played the uh, original Nier? Uh, I have really? not, but I no. understand it to be far in the past of this game, yeah. like multiple thousands of years separated. Mm-hmm. But that now to play that. Events of Nier One are night. distantly connected to events of Nier, Nier Automata. Yeah. I also understand the original Nier to be inscrutable. Oh, yeah, yeah. it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> not One great. day. Not today. Sounds like it's yeah. right up our alley. Well, I think that's it for Near Automata Part A, at least. We will see how many more sections we can get through in the next two weeks, and we'll likely have at least one or two more routes complete by then. Mm-hmm. So tune in for that. Uh, remember, you can reach out to the show at Deep Listens Pod on Twitter, deeplistens.libsen.com. We've got comment sections and deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com. And now you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash deeplistens. Mm-hmm. Join our community. We've got a Discord. It's very nice and put it together. There's nothing on it yet. I gotta actually put job. words. We need to fill it with people. Yeah. So do that. Um thank thank you, Pete. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Remember robots aren't people, but that's only because nobody's people. People aren't a thing. <laughs> Great point. Thank you, M. Thank you. Uh let's Keep at this for a while because I don't have another game in mind. <laughs> <laughs> I did not come prepared. Sorry, we have a lot more content to get through. Yep. Here. Yep. And thank you, Billy, for guest appearing. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Always a pleasure. I think personhood matters and that AI or robots or androids or whatever you want to call them will never achieve personhood. <laughs> Very by the harsh. end, of, We'll see what happens by the end of this game. Yeah. Oh, you mean this work of fiction? Sure. I mean, yeah, we we can we we can talk about it like it's a book club, but it's you know, it's fiction. fiction. That's the whole. We're not podcast. We're not doing this now. We're not doing this now. <laughs> We're, We're not doing this now. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Till next time. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>